Cause when we see you, we find strength to face the day. In your presence, all our fears are washed away. Wash away. Good morning once again. Happy Palm Sunday. Uh, I have the honor and privilege to give uh, a Palm Sunday service uh, before, um, as, as, as I hopefully I can set up Resurrection Sunday the best that I can uh, for us to understand just the significance uh, of this most important day for, for us as Christians. And so uh, we want to share a passage, Matthew chapter 21. I want to read verses 1 through 11. Now when they drew near to Jerusalem, they came to Bethpage on the Mount of Olives. Then Jesus sent his two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village in front of you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and with a colt with her. And tie them and bring them to me, and if anyone asks anything to you, you shall say to them, The Lord needs them, and he will send them at once. 
And this took place to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet, saying, Say to the daughters of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a beast of a burden. The disciples went and did as Jesus had directed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and put them in their cloaks, and he sat on them. Most of the crowd spread their cloaks on the, ground, on the, on the road, and the others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. And the crowds that went before him and that followed him were shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And he entered Jerusalem. The whole city was stirred up saying, Who is this? And the crowd said, This is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth of Galilee. Let's pray. Father, we come to you before you. Um, And a very familiar passage, Lord, uh, a passage that describes your entry into Jerusalem as you head towards the cross. But as a triumphant entry, not because you have defeated an enemy, but because you will defeat an enemy on the cross. And so that, Lord God, we have a forward-looking attitude and posture, Lord, as we look again, back again to what you have done for us, the victory and the triumph that you have uh, won upon that cross. And so, Lord, help us to, to reflect upon that, to see the power of the triumph. Lord, I pray that you would speak to us this morning. Uh, would you um, remind us again of your deep truths of your word? Would you give us ears to hear and hearts to receive your words of truth and life? Help us to be one once again at awe of who you are and what you've done for us. Would you speak to us, Lord? Thank you once again. In your son's name we all pray this. Amen and amen. Uh, well, I want to just describe three um, elements of, of the, that we find in this passage. And the, the title of my sermon is called uh, Palms, Cloaks, and the Cross. And I think each one of those things um, means something. So hopefully I can, within this short time, I can um, convey uh, the meaning and the significance of these uh, for us this morning. Um, back a few years, uh, I used to uh, pick up uh, students from Canada at the LA airport. Uh, we'd have ministry things, and uh, a lot of students from Canada would come. And whenever I picked them up from LAX, we would drive down, and uh, the first thing that they would always say, that they would always notice, is, "Look at all these palm trees here." And so I guess they don't have any palm trees in, in Canada, and they were amazed by just so many palm trees. And and honestly, us as Californians, we will probably never notice the amount of palm trees that we have. But if you look around, around when we drive around the freeway, you'll see that we have palm trees uh, everywhere. Uh, now, for us, what do palm trees represent? What do they symbolize? Like for me, when I look at palm trees, uh, I, I, I think of Hawaii or, or paradise. For me, like I, it symbolizes uh, paradise. And so I don't know why we have so many palm trees. They're not even native here for California. I think literally we wanted to bring some, some paradise into, uh, into uh, California. But for us, palm trees, and, and, and they, they remind us of something. But what, what, is it, what does it symbolize for the Jews? Like what was the significance of these palm branches they laid down before Jesus as he rode by? What, what, do, they, what do they mean? Well, hopefully I can, we can look at these things um, as we go through this passage. Now, uh, the setting of, of, of what's going on here, remember everyone's coming into Jerusalem, right? Everyone's coming into Jerusalem to celebrate Passover. So it's one of the three um, most significant pilgrimages. So there's people, there's Jews all over the regions coming, flooding into the small city of, of Jerusalem. And Jesus is, is riding in. And we have to imagine there's a, there's a, a religious kind of high, a, a, a fervor that's happening, like electricity throughout the city because this is the most significant day for them to, to come, finally come into Jerusalem to, uh, to, to come and give, give their offerings and to, and to worship. But also this is a very, this is a very unique um, Passover as well uh, because people have heard of who this Jesus is. And so there's a frenzy, a mob of people, not only to celebrate Passover, but to also hopefully catch a glimpse of this Jesus. Right before this, this entry into Jerusalem, Jesus had done one of his most, the, one of the, the most powerful, amazing miracle, which was raising Lazarus from the dead. And, and you got to imagine, like, word probably spread around fast. And so this even heightened the, um, uh, the excitement of all these people. Jesus just, wrote, uh, just raised Lazarus from the dead. And so hopefully 
And so, and so we have this mixture of these crowds um, uh, hoping to see Jesus, but also we have also a mixture of the Pharisees were extremely jealous and they were ready to kill Jesus because they see that so many of the followers are following Jesus. And so we have this mixed bag of, of people who want to see Jesus and people who want to see Jesus dead, all in this, this small city of Jerusalem. So this is, this is the context that we're talking about. And here Jesus strolling in on a donkey, you know, um, fulfilling prophecy of the Old Testament. It only adds to to the excitement of what is happening. So this crowd, I want to talk about this crowd, this this multitude, they were really caught up with all the excitement of all that was happening. Um, And they even followed Jesus around. And so these are the same crowd that followed Jesus around to be fed by Him, to be healed by Him. And so for them, they expect, they have a certain expectation of Jesus to get something from Him, to, to receive something him, from Him. And what are they expecting Jesus to do in Jerusalem? Well, they're expecting and hoping that He would become the King of Israel. They were hoping that finally He would overthrow the government and establish the, uh, the nation of Israel once again. And they're saying, Hosanna in the highest, the son of David. So what they're saying is, Jesus is the, 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 one, who, the, the, the one who would come from the line of David and to be seated on the throne of David. And so they're expecting something from Jesus, to receive something from Jesus. And what is that? For Jesus to be king and for them to be freed and liberated. And I think this is a very important thing to to notice because the crowd was only seeking Jesus for their needs to be met. John describes this whole scene and he gives this little detail in John chapter 12 verse 18. He says, the reason why the crowd went to meet him was that they had heard what he had done. Uh, They heard he had done this sign, the sign meaning uh, raising Lazarus from the dead. And it describes this crowd only coming to seek Jesus for something to receive from him. And so they they, they went ahead uh, to Jerusalem, hopefully to receive something from him. And there's this difference and contrast between the crowd and his disciples. Because see, the crowd sought Jesus for what he will do for them. Whereas his disciples followed Jesus because of what he is to them. And they knew that Jesus was the Son of, Son of God. And they knew that he was the true Messiah. So they, they, they understood and identified him rightly. But the crowd, they followed him for what he would give for them. So they had expectations to receive something. And again, what were they expecting? They were shouting Hosanna because they were expecting him to be their king and for them to be their servants. They were expecting Jesus to establish their kingdom and to finally free them of oppression, to give them a nation finally, to establish their kingdom once again. But they were expecting these things to happen in the physical realm. And so then they were disappointed. Their expectations were not met because it was never Jesus' intention to establish this kingdom on earth physically, but rather to establish the kingdom of God within our hearts. It wasn't Jesus' intention for us, for, uh, for Him to come and, and give us um, uh, things for our flesh and for our bodies and for our life, rather to give us true spiritual life. And so the, the, the Jews, they missed it. They were thinking and expecting something to feed their physical bodies, and yet Jesus came to feed their spiritual bodies, and yet they were disappointed. And when expectations are not met, what follows? Disappointment. And if your expectations are really high, then disappointment becomes violent. And we see that. Their hosannas became crucify Him because, again, He said, who is this Jesus? He is a fraud. He is a hoax. He tricked us all. What what kingdom is he going to establish if he's being arrested like this? This is not the true king of Israel. And so they turned on him because their expectations of him was not met. Now we ask ourselves, what do we expect from Jesus? Because let's face it, we all have certain expectations. But are our expectations of Jesus, are they right? Are they, are they biblical? Is it, is, are they fair? What do we expect from Jesus? Because let's face it, a lot of things that we expect from God and for Jesus is to fulfill our physical bodies, to fulfill our physical needs. 
we're tired, we're hungry, we're difficult, we have a crisis, and, and we expect these things that we expect God to, 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 to magically just take all these things and just kind of wipe them all out, and, and we find ourselves still hurting. We say, God, where are you? Some, some people may even turn away from Him because our expectations are not met. But the problem doesn't lie with God not meeting His expectations. The problem lies with our expectations of Him. We have the wrong expectations of Him. And this is why the Jews were so disappointed, because they had the wrong expectations of Jesus. What do we expect from Jesus? To fulfill our physical bodies or to fulfill our souls? And so Jesus is entering into the city of Jerusalem, and these people are laying down their palm branches. And and what do the palm branches represent? For Israel, for us, it might represent paradise, at least for me. But for the Jews, palm branches represented and symbolized national pride. It it, it, it represented victory. It it represented, um, um, finally, uh, our nation is going to be established. And so the palm branch represented their nation. They had a lot of pride uh, in that. And also, it was a way for them to celebrate and to worship. As they're laying down the palms, they were celebrating, Hosanna, Hosanna. And so for them, they were, they were worshiping, not Jesus, but rather they were worshiping because they were going to receive something from Him. So those were the palm branches represented. And, and I wonder for us, what is our worship in response to? Is our worship in response to the things that we receive from God? In other words, is our worship for the gifts or for the giver? Because for these Jews, they were worshiping Him because of what He will give them. But I want to remind us that our worship for, for, for Jesus, our, our worship to God, is not because of what we have received, but rather because of who He is. He is, he is God. He is, our, he, he, is, he is Jesus Christ. He is the Son of God. And yet, He yet does give us eternal life. Again, we worship the giver, not the gifts. And the cloaks, they took off their cloaks and they put it down before the donkey so the donkey could trample over it. And what do the cloaks represent? It represents submission. Because they see that Jesus is going to be their king and they take off their cloaks, put it before Him, and that represents my submission to my Lord. I'm going to trust that you're going to, you're going to, you're going to clothe me. I'm going to trust that you're going to feed me. I'm going to trust that you're going to lead me. You're going to be my king. And so I'm going to surrender and submit to you. And that was a, that was a, a way to show Jesus that they're going to surrender and give their life to serve Jesus. But how quickly that evaporated. They didn't follow Jesus to the cross. In fact, the disciples didn't even follow Jesus. They all ran away. Jesus, they, uh, even the disciples and even Peter, they all gave this, this promise uh, and commitment to Jesus. I'm going to follow you to the death. And life it gets a little hard. It gets a little difficult. Kind of back out of our promises. That is, what, that is what the cloaks represented. See, it is so easy that we would gladly lay down our palm branches and future expectations of God's blessings and His and His favor. We would gladly put down our cloaks and lay down before Him to show them, Jesus, I'm going to follow you to the death until whatever it takes, until life becomes difficult and hard. But I want to just encourage us and impress upon all of us that the palm branches that we lay down, the cloak that we lay down before Jesus, is not in response to the gifts that we receive, but rather because of who He is and the life that He has given us. The people were expecting a crown for Jesus, but Jesus was expecting and looking forward to a cross. And that was what was the difference. The crowd was expecting a crown for Jesus, and yet Jesus was looking forward to a cross. And that is where he found his triumph. This triumphant entry, again, is not because of what he has conquered before. No, is he's, he's entering in Jerusalem in order to conquer death itself, conquering the cross. And next week we see why he was so triumphant, because he rose from the dead after the three days, giving us the promise and hope that we will also share in the life in Jesus. See, if only the people of Israel knew what Jesus came here to do, to die on a cross, 
and say, I have triumphed over death and you share this life in with me. See, they thought that they would set, be set free because if they put a crown on Jesus' head, they would be set free. But it's only through the cross that Jesus would truly set us free. It is only through the cross that we actually get a crown. We actually get a crown of righteousness, not our own righteousness, but the righteousness of Christ. Isn't that crazy? Jesus took upon the cross, not for him to get a crown, but for us to get a crown of righteousness. Why? Because Jesus is already king. And so I, I want to ask us to remind us and challenge us. Is our worship and our submission to the king always in response to what Jesus did on the cross? I hope it is. Let's close with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you again. We worship you. We worship you. Not because of the gifts that we receive, but firstly because of who you are as our King, as our Lord, and in response of gratitude of the life that you have given us through your death. Father, I thank you so, so much for this grace that we do not deserve. And so as we are reminded of the palm branches and the cloaks and all the things that these, the crowd was shouting out, these promises, Lord God. Father, may we also lay down our promises down before you and trust and trust that God, that you will, that you will overcome all things for us because you have triumphed on the cross. So Lord, we look ahead, we look forward to Resurrection Sunday. And God, that we are once again filled with hope. We're once again reminded of why you came here on this earth to die, to give us life, to be in glory with your Father so that we also may share in that glory after this life. So Father, we thank you again. We worship you. We celebrate you. And in Jesus' name, we all pray this. And all God's people said, Amen and Amen.